Next uh, speaker is Raj Koshla. He is from, the, from Colorado State University. Uh, he is actually joining us in between trips. Um, and so I'm very appreciative of his uh, being able to make it here today. Uh, and you're going to, I think, really enjoy what he has to talk about. And I will just turn it over to him at this point. Thank you, Steve. Uh, great pleasure for me to be here. Um, this is my first time ever presenting uh, anything or participating in an international conference uh, related to pest management. I'm a soil scientist by training. I've been working in the area of precision agriculture for the last 20 years. My lab has done a lot of work at Colorado State with reference to quantifying spatial variability in soils, and you will see that. And then our allied projects have taken our work into pest management, plant pathology, uh, weed sciences, and things like that. And I have some case studies that I'll walk you through. And then, uh, depending on the time, I may uh, end my presentation talking about proximal sensing. OK. So if I were to look back, individuals like I, who have been working in the area of precision management, what have we achieved in the last 20, 25 years since inception of precision agriculture? Um, and so here's a good example. This is field 3100, uh, just north of Fort Collins. And um, what previous speaker uh, talked about acquiring imagery, we did this with airborne imagery. Uh, growth stage for the corn is about four to six leaf stage. And then our lab and many other labs in the country help translate that data into crop wigger maps and uh, further develop algorithms so that we can translate crop wigger map then into site-specific management. In this case, we're talking nitrogen management. And uh, you can have a prescription map, something like this, that you can either uh, send it through a connected farm that, that, that's a Trimble product or uh, on a USB stick to a tractor so that when you are when the farmer is going across the field, he or she is variably applying uh, nitrogen in this case as it goes across the field. Now, why, why are we doing this? Well, the whole crux of doing precision management because of something that we're all very familiar with, that's variability. Variability in space and variability in time. And in fact, uh, I recently wrote a chapter with David Muller from University of Minnesota that's going to be published in Advances in Soil Science, talking about the history of spatial variability and precision management. And we found a paper from Mercer and Hall from Rothamsted documenting spatial variability uh, about 100 years back. So this is not a new phenomenon. We have known this for a long time. Uh, back then, we didn't have the technology or the techniques to do anything about it. Today, we do, and we are harnessing that to make our production more, pro uh, more productive, profitable, efficient, and, and in a su sustainable manner. Um, I'm privileged to be working in, in many countries. I have projects in many parts of the world. And what we have found is that spatial variability is documented globally. It's not unique to North America. So uh, you may have a field that we may choose to make a uniform application or do a um, average application. Um, and when you do that, by choice, what we're doing is in some parts of the field, we are way over applying. In other parts of the field, we're, we're way under applying. I know most of us are familiar with yield monitoring. And I teach three courses at CSU in Precision Ag. And in, in one of my labs, I ask my students that if you have a 100-acre field, calculate the average yield, OK? And they can immediately do that using the GIS. And they say, OK, it's 227 bushels. My next question to them is, now write a query and, and find out how many pixels. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to go to my water. How many pixels in that field actually matches to 227 bushels? What's your answer? You're lucky if 10% of the pixels would match that mathematical average. And for centuries, e and even today, we're managing our fields uniformly, one size fits all approach. <coughs> and that's where ma precision management comes in. If you're targeting average, you're either over applying or under applying. 
Spatial variability is something that occurs across scales. It's independent of scales. I know precision ag happened in North America and spread out in numerous other countries, but here's an image coming from uh, a six-hour drive south of Beijing from Judo, uh, and these fields are actually not fields, they are, they are entire farms, what you see here. Some of them are as small as one-third of an acre. And our work there has documented, and we have published literature now, where the scale of variability that you will see in fields in Colorado, quarter section fields, 200% variability, or sometimes 300% variability, we see in these small fields as well, small farms as well. So, uh, variability happens at multiple scales. If you're flying over Nebraska or Colorado, this is a very common scene. If I were to zoom in, I'm going now from regional scale variability to a farm scale variability. You may have uh, 15 pivots, a lot of dryland farming, as you see here. And then I can zoom in on one particular field, and we're looking at the field scale variability. Well, why am I emphasizing so much on variability? Well, there's a reason for that. So uh, now you have variability that's being captured by remote sensing, uh, in this case, airborne imagery. And the reason spatial variability is so important because when you take a quick look right here, that footprint that you see in soil actually translates into your plant vigor, plant growth, and finally in the harvest product, the grain yield that we are chasing, okay? Um, many of us uh, around the country spend a lot of times in um, early 90s, late 90s, and, and many places uh, we're still working on how do we develop quick, affordable ways of capturing that variability. And many of us did a lot of work with grit soil sampling and very quickly realized that, look, it's labor intensive, time consuming, and it's not affordable. And that's what really lent us other opportunities to quantify variability, and one of them was management zone. This definition, which is very widely uh, cited in literature given by Tom Dorgie, is a subregion of field that expresses a homogeneous combination of yield limiting factors. What it really means is that, look, you have one large field, and within that one large field, you have smaller fields that reside in that one large field. And instead of treating that entire large field as one management unit, if you were to delineate management zone, you can variably manage those smaller fields that reside in that large field. Well, it's easier said than done, because how do you begin to draw lines where those fields are. And that's where a lot of math and geostatistics are involved. Again, this is a remote sensing image uh, for a field in Colorado, uh, irrigated corn. Uh, very first thing, you go out and map the field boundary, and then we will enhance the contrast okay, uh, of the field. And so the darker areas of the field that have high water holding capacity, uh, more organic carbon, are classified as areas of high productivity, and on the contrast, areas that have more coarser texture soil, sandier texture soil, low organic carbon, uh, low reflectance, um, would classified as low productivity management zones. So what we have done in Colorado, funding given by USDA uh, and NASA, this is at least uh, 15 or more years back, we developed four different techniques of delineating management zones. And I'm not going to go into details of those techniques, but I'm just going to quickly walk you through the data layers that went into one particular management zone. And actually, that has been commercially available for more than 10 years now. So I'm going to zoom in on this particular field so that you can see it a little bit better. Uh, the first data layer that, that we employed was, again, remote sensing. It's a bare soil image. And one of my graduate students looked at 17 different data layers that when you fly an airplane or task a satellite to acquire bare soil image on a conventionally tilled field, what is it that you're capturing? And we capture a lot. You can actually uh, acquire remote sensing imagery for a bare soil to help quantify distribution of soil organic matter across the field.
or even uh, water holding capacity or moisture content, this would not be an absolute value that 2.3% of organic matter happens there, but we're not chasing absolute values in precision agriculture. What we're chasing is spatial patterns. Where does the pattern change from one level to another level? And that's what we're all about. In addition to bare soil image that we uh, use remote sensing to do that, another very important data layer in our environment is topography. And for this, you don't necessarily need a $50,000 uh, GPS receiver to have a very high resolution on the, on the elevation or the altitude. You can use a $50 GPS because you're not trying to measure, again, absolute elevation, but relative change in the topography as you go from one part of the field to another part of the field. With topography, you can develop digital elevation models, and that's very important even for integrated pest management. I say so because you can translate that information into developing slopes, okay? And slope and the aspects are very important. Uh, part of the field that are facing south and so southwest aspect, plants undergo stress a lot more than the plants that are on the north and northeast aspect of the field. Likewise, we are working in the irrigated environment, water flow maps. Just with one data layers, you can then use GIS analysts to develop water flow maps, and for that reason, water pooling maps. And all these parameters are very important when you think about pest management. Where would pests would like to uh, have a good time in the field, if you may, uh, in terms of when they're posing infestation? Uh, third data layer. This, this is a kind of unique data layer, uh, and that's really put us on the global map. Uh, we were among the very first ones to employ farmer's experience. And there's a, there's a story behind it. I remember uh, after doing a very intensive grid soil sampling and preparing multiple uh, spatial maps, we went and sat down with Larry Roth, one of the uh, farmers in Morgan County, Colorado. And we're showing him the maps, and he says, Dr. Kosla, with all due respect, this is not my field. And I said, Larry, we, this is your field. This is all the data. We have taken hundreds of soil sample, and we have created interpolated maps. He says, this is not my field. Well, long story short, what Larry was referring to, that I have farmed this ground for 27 years. I know my ground. And you all have come and took 100 soil samples and have created these interpolated maps. It's not reflecting what I already know about my field. Well, the light bulb went off, and we said, well, is there a way to capture farmer's experience? Now, remember, these were the days when we didn't have the luxury of having five years of yield map data or 10 years of yield map data that you can do sensitivity analysis and really peg and hone in on stable areas of the field. So we, uh, would, what we would do, I'll have those four or five kilos Fujitsu pentop unit, these were panchromatic in those days, we'll go out, map those units, and we'll sit down with individuals like Larry who have a lot of experience in farming and then have him draw areas of the field that are consistently low producing in a good year or a bad year, and then areas of the field that are high producing. What we will do next is that we will stack these three data layers, one that was acquired using remote sensing, topography, um, inexpensive GPS unit, and farmer's experience. And we will do, uh, again, geostatistics, or we used uh, modified residual regression trees to translate these three data layers into one. Okay, so now you have a quarter section field, about 120 acres in size, and um, that has multiple smaller regions, what we call management zones, that allows you to manage the field uniformly when you are in a zone, but variably as you go across the zone. In fact, what you see here are our experimental strips. These are 60 rows of corn wide that we use to evaluate numerous ways of managing nitrogen in this particular example, okay? And so traits such as dark color, low-lying topography, historic high yields would translate into low zones and vice versa. 
So here's a real field, that's a real map, and then the farmer will use the equipment, whatever they have, to do a variable rate application as they go across the field, okay? We have done a lot of work uh, with this particular technique, and I have now more than 50 site years of data. Um, and uh, we have really captured grain yield variability. As you go from low to high management zone, there is a very distinct difference agronomically and statistically as you go from low, medium, and high zones. One thing I do want to point out that if I were to redelineate management zone on that same field today, it will have a lot finer resolution. Because in those days, remember, our applicators, which are, have grown bigger, 60, um, 60, not, 60 foot wide, 90 foot wide, or 120 foot wide, they will deliver only one rate of whatever product that you have. Today, we have sectional booms, so you can have eight, 10 more sections, or depending on how much, how much investment you have in your sprayer, you can applied at every nozzle level, okay? So we have the technology. So what we were doing in the previous example, if I may go really quickly, after running our management zone algorithm, we will have a lot of small islands, which may be very small in size, but when the equipment will go on top of that island, right, there's no way for us to make a different application rate, so we'll run a smoothing algorithm that matches with the equipment width of the farmer that farmer would have and we uh, so we can do a lot better job than what we have right here okay so the question in our larger group there are about uh, 22 of us faculty member ARS scientist from multiple different disciplines extension people sociologists the question was, could we use management zones for the purpose of integrated pest management? And so some of our students did work on that. I'm going to show you some quick uh, findings from that. Um, so we said, well, let's start with weed. Are weeds behaving differently as you go from production level management zones? And so we had a whole crew of uh, our students who will go out with Quadrat. We'll develop a, a grid sampling strategy, very, very, very high intensive grid sampling strategy uh, because these are point samples data that we're now going to interpolate. And so they will walk in uh, with, uh, with the GPS unit and pen top and then they'll put the quadrat down and then we'll start looking at the weeds and start documenting this weed species as well as uh, taking pictures um, and counting how much there is. And then they will also, uh, with the image, they will do image analysis to find out how much of that area is actually weed free within each quadrat, okay? So here's the total weeds per quadrat by management zone. This is three years of data done by Scott O'Meara uh, with co-advising with Philip Vestra. Many of you may know Phil Vestra and myself. And so what you have here is data across low, medium, and high management zones and the years on the x-axis and the mean total weeds per quadrat. So you do see that uh, there is a relationship as you go from low, medium, and high management zones in terms of mean total weeds per quadrat. Now the relationship holds somewhat in two years, but it falls apart uh, in year three, okay? In terms of percent weed-free quadrat by management zone that was done using image analysis, uh, looking at vegetation, identified weed species, uh, for the three years that Scott did this work across three management zones, low, medium, and high, uh, there is some trend. Uh, you see a trend right here as well, but that brings my bias because it's statistically not different. For one of the locations, this work was done uh, for multiple years at multiple locations. And in terms of total weeds per quadrat, this is pivot 39 in Morgan County. Um, here's that interpolated map. So there is not, so you can't completely throw the data out that, that look, there's no spatial correlation. There is spatial correlation. Location does matter. But does that relationship hold over time? That's the key question. Could we help 
identify zones for the farmers that allow them to do variable rate herbicide application. And then there are several other factors that come into play, the soil type, organic carbon, and so on and so forth. And here's data for another field. So a tremendous amount of work did go into this. Uh, a lot of it is hand sampling and hand counting, some image analysis. And what Scott in his dissertation concluded that, look, management zone is indeed a very powerful tool when it comes to nutrient management. Uh, but large-scale zoning based on crop species is actually inappropriate for weeds. Okay, and now at that time we didn't have access to UAVs. Uh, and, and tasking Cessna planes is not always the easiest thing. And so what he concluded in his dissertation work that look, and, and we have an advisory board as well where we work with practitioners, regulators, uh, farmers, uh, industry folks. Uh, we meet with them periodically at least two or three times during the, growing, uh, during the calendar year and we keep asking them for the feedback. Look, this is what we have done and based on the feedback, uh, that's what led uh, Scott come to a conclusion that farmers, their comfort zone lies in either spraying or not spraying, not in variable rate herbicide application. And I'm not, a, I'm not a IPM person, I'm a soil scientist, so this may make more sense to you all. Uh, but I, I get it, I, you know, feed is something that farmers have very little tolerance to and they would like to get rid of it as soon as you can. Changing gears a little bit, uh, this work is done by Silas Davidson, a, another PhD student with me and Frank Pierce. Many of you may know Frank Pierce. We were looking at how do insects behave with respect to management zones, okay? And that's, that's what this study is about. So what uh, I learned in this process that uh, for practitioners to go out and uh, figure out whether or not that they're going to make a application, uh, they will go out and pick up four locations in the field and then they will plug in that numbers uh, to calculate the economic threshold limit, uh, that which is ET economic threshold, i.e. larvae per plants. Uh, CC stands for control cost, dollars per acre that you want to invest, expected yield times market value and what is the loss factor depending on the scale of infestation, right? So, oops. So if if you are working with an average uh, one-size-fits-all approach before precision management and this field had an expected yield of 170 bushel, that's your economic threshold right there. But what Silas evaluated, that if you have three management zones, low, medium, and high, and the grain yield go from 140 to 200 bushels per acre, Instead of just having four sampling locations, you will now go to 12 sampling locations across the field, recalculate your economic injury levels, okay, or thresholds, and you will find that the decision to treat and when to treat and how much area to treat dramatically shifts, okay? Because you have more at stake in high management zones, okay? then what you have at stake in low management zones versus when you're going out and shooting in the dark, in my, in my mind, when you're completely ignoring the variability that has a lot of relevance. When we saw this data, uh, Silas's data, then very next question that popped up in our mind, hey, are there differences in pest densities by management zones? Because if there are no differences in pest densities, it doesn't make sense to do variable rate or even turn on and off type applications. So there were two approaches that Silas Davidson looked at it. One was differential survival, another one was differential colonization, okay? So uh, there were three uh, pests that Silas worked with, with corn, western corn rootworm. And what he found across high, medium, and uh, low management zones in terms of a larvae per plant for western corn rootworm Fascinating piece of data. Agronomically different and statistically different uh, larvae per plant for western corn rootworm as you go from high, medium, and low. And this is for three site years of data. Okay, something that we, we had not thought. Uh, we thought that we will find more pests in low producing areas and the relationship was completely opposite. 
Well, he investigated three um, uh, pests. This is European corn borer. larvae per plant, and then the western bean cutworm. This is larvae per year. We did not find uh, egg distribution to be different across the zones, but we did find larvae per year to be significantly different across zones. Okay? So pest densities, uh, we found that did vary by management zones. Uh, densities were generally greater in high productivity zones and differences seem to be due to both differential survival as well colonization. So this was, this was outstanding work done by Silas. Um, he did publish that um, in the Journal of uh, Entomology. Okay. I'm going to switch gears now and I see I still have about four minutes so I'll see if I can wrap this up. So, about seven or eight years back, sensors happened, right? These are active sensors, and my previous colleague did an excellent job in, in defining what remote sensing is and, and how we can take advantage of that. And so as a soil scientist, our main emphasis in our lab is chasing nitrogen, okay? So um, last four minutes, bear with me on that. And so you have a sensor, whether it's uh, Yara or whether it's Green Seeker or whatever, you have it, and you have the ability to now do proximal sensing. So you're very close to the object of interest, in this case, uh, corn. And it spits out uh, some kind of uh, vegetative index, in this case, normalized difference vegetative index. Now, there are algorithms out there that, including my lab, has, has developed and written, and what, what you do then, if you're making a application primarily based on crop canopy, you'll have a uniform rate because the NDVI readings were this. And if you go this route, you, we're making a mistake because we're ignoring the location. Because you may have three sets of plans that give you the same reflectance at that particular growth stage, but because they're located in different parts of the field in different soil types, what we really need to do, and that's what my lab is working on right now, is developing a more complicated algorithm that incorporates both soil reflectance as well as what we have captured about soil, and, and then the application dramatically changes. Okay? One of my students, Tim Shaver, who's now a faculty member in Nebraska, uh, did this work with two sensors, Crop Circle and Green Seeker. And what he found is that if you compare amber is uh, Crop Circle and red is uh, Green Seeker, what he found is that at six leaf growth stages, when you're trying to capture that variability that's out there, well, our square values are, are okay, but they're not outstanding. I can't go to my farmer and say, hey, let's make our decision based on these values. And our relationship increases as we go further. But how many farmers are making application decision by the plant is already at 14 leaf stage? Zero in my state, okay? So, so we said, well, why is it that, that this kind of sensor uh, that gives out the same piece of information what satellites used to give or airborne imagery used to give completely falls apart. So we went back to the drawing board. We said, hey, the plants are about, you know, this is how they look at different growth stages. And when you're looking at a, a proximal sensor, that's how far they are. Actually, this, was, this is what you're looking at. Our object of interest is green vegetation. And everything else is noise for us. So the noise to signal ratio is dramatically high. And when you move further in the growing season, this is what you're looking now. And so your, your ability to predict that variability on how much to apply, where to apply, dramatically changes as you go across the field and as, as you go across that. And so what happens then, uh, a company from France uh, called Force A contacted my lab about three years back. They said, we have a new sensor that can measure fluorescence in the broad daylight. I said, no, get out, you can't do that. They said, no, we can do that. Well, fluorescence is a aspect of remote sensing that has been largely ignored by agronomists. It has been around for three, four decades. But the way you measure fluorescence is you bring 
plants inside the lab in the dark chamber, bombard the plant with a high-intensity laser beam, and then a very feeble signature, which is fluorescence, the plant fluoresces, that you capture. Well, how do you capture in the broad daylight? Well, they said, no, they can't do it. So they gave one of their sensors for our lab for us to evaluate and help them develop algorithm. Oops. Well, it's 30 minutes. <laughs> No, no, it did not cut off on me. It is 30 minutes. No, go, ahead. go ahead. Okay. Well, the chair says go ahead. Um, so what is fluorescence? Um, so let's assume that this is a molecule, uh, a chlorophyll molecule, and so it's a fluorofluor, meaning it will fluoresce. So what happens when an incident ray of light hits this molecule? It excites it. It goes to a higher level of uh, photon electron energy, and then it gets tired, it loses that energy, comes to its original state, and that's what that small, feeble signature comes out of the plant. That you and I cannot see it with our naked eye, right? But the sensor can, right? And so we said, okay, well, that's an interesting sensor. Why not we take advantage of that? So very first thing we said, because we were kind of burnt out with, the, with uh, Green Seeker, with the soil noise, we said, Let's test the soil noise. So my postdoc, Louis Longchamps, he created two soil surfaces. One is bare soil and one with the residue and said, okay, let's start looking at it. What happens? There's plenty of noise at 10 centimeter, okay? But by the time you get to the 15 centimeter or 20 centimeter, now you have plateaued off and there is no more noise coming from soil. And in fact, the the system says that you should be taking measurements at 20 centimeters above, above the canopy. So if the plant is already yay high and you're above 20 centimeter, there's no soil noise coming out to that. Well, this god is excited, okay? And so here's the plant and here's the sensor, so you're almost always at 20 centimeter or higher, okay? This sensor spits out 12 indices, not just one, 12. And plus, people like us, you know, we like to change filters. And if you start changing filters, you can create n amount of indices. So we're just getting ready to play more with this. Um, Louis went out, uh, did soil sampling, found the sample that has the least amount of residual nitrogen, brought it into the lab, and we started doing some n experiments, okay? Uh, we looked at four different n rates. I know n rate is something not of interest for you all. I'll just quickly show you and I'll end it in the next couple of slides. And so he took a lot of measurements with plant growth uh, throughout in the, in the greenhouse. And the very first thing we want to do, did crop respond it or not? Well, it's a greenhouse experiment, better respond, and did a phenomenal job. So no surprises there, right? But then we started looking at nitrogen balance index that's coming out of the blue light. And here are the end rates. When I looked at this data the first time, I didn't believe it. And actually, we ran that experiment again in the greenhouse, okay? And now we're at a level that at V3 growth stage, we can pick up differences in nitrogen variability. Now, this is in static condition. This is not moving. So one of my students, Rafael de Sequeira from Brazil, is now, they have given us a prototype that we have mounted in on a high clearance tractor that we're running it in the field. And, and, this, and the relationship just improves as you go further across the different. We published a paper um, that came out early last year, um, first time documenting that we can pick up nitrogen differences. Now, this company says that because you're picking a fluorescence, you're picking a phenolics, you're picking up biochemical activities in the plant, there's a lot more that you can pick up, okay? And so uh, my current graduate student, Mariana, uh, with me and Frank Pierce, she's looking at asymptomatic detection of insect pests. So what she is doing, and so the plant looks healthy uh, to our eyes, but not to the sensor. So what she's doing, she's infesting plant uh, populations in the field as well as in the lab. And I asked Mariana to give me some data, and she said, no, she wants to present it, so I don't have any data, and I don't blame her. She should be the one presenting this. That um, in, our, in her multiple trials, she's able to pick up insect pest infestation two days prior to when she could see it from her eyes. 
So this is sensing 2.0. This is sensing 2.0. It's coming down the pipe, and I think there's a lot more things that we could capture separating uh, nitrogen uh, from insect infestation, from disease uh, infestation. It's happening. I call it sensing 2.0. I'll stop right here, Steve. Uh, and we are now into lunch. So I won't be here this afternoon. I have another place to go to. So if there's a question or two, I'll hang out right here, and I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, right.